back to Hertel Radio. I'm Andrew Donaldson. Thrilled to have you and get to talk to somebody. I love covering his stuff and I love reading his book that we'll talk about later. But uh, our friend Eric Garcia from The Independent. Uh, how are you, sir? Appreciate your time today. Doing all right. Thank you very much for having me. You wrote not one but two pieces on the passing of the late Bob Dole. One of them was more political. We'll get to that one in a minute. But um, just legacy wise, you took an angle on it because you do a lot of writing and advocacy on this issue anyway. But how important in that time period, the post-World War II era, was it to have uh, people with disabilities like Bob Dole front and center in American politics? Because before that, and remember, this is the age where TV starts. This is the age where mass media yeah. starts. How important was that for the development of disability rights in America to have people like him? Yeah, I mean, I would argue it goes back all the way back to the Civil War. A lot of the uh, pensions and benefits, a lot of the things that become kind of enshrined later and are encoded in law started out because of veterans, because of disabled veterans during the Civil War. You see it again after World War I. Um, uh, to say, you know, that's where we get the term basket cases from people who literally lost all their limbs um, and had to be carried around in a basket. So that was so it, it, so disabled veterans have always, always been an integral part of uh, of advocating for disability rights that would, that would benefit all people with disabilities. Uh, then when it came to World War II afterward, I think what happened was it there were so many just because of the 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 length of the war and because unlike the civil war where it was you know brother literally brother against brother this was there's this kind of shared feeling of um these were people with common experiences and you saw that with bob dole and daniel Inouye and phil hart they all recovered at percy jones hospital in michigan together uh phil hart and bob dole were of co uh, phil hart and Dan Inouye were democrats and bob dole was a republican so there was this shared feeling of there needs to be something done. There needs to be some kind of accommodations. And you also had a lot of these disabled veterans coming to Congress afterward. Uh, there were around that time from like the 1940s to the, to, from the late 1940s to the 1950s, you just saw a, a tidal wave of veterans who came back and that 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 way doesn't just include disabled veterans it includes jfk it includes richard nixon uh so so i think that it was integral because this was a this was an experience that was shared not just by a very niche group of people these were people who you know a large percent of the population went to war and understood the cost of war so i think it was incredibly important how do you put it? Because like somebody like JFK, who kept his health very private, although he had days even as president, his health was horrible. He couldn't walk most days on right. for a lot of not just his military injuries from World War II, but other health issues. Addison disease. Right. You have this sort of thing. But then you have people uh, like Bob Dole, like the senators who, you know, uh, when it's front and center like that, uh, they really kind of made people deal with this issue. And then, of course, their lawmakers, it just kind of went together like, hey, this has to be addressed because it's front and center for folks. Right. They could, you couldn't really ignore it. And I think it was incredibly important. If you remember during World War II, FDR, he wouldn't be photographed with his wheelchair. Right. Uh, and, and John F. Kennedy, you know, he had a back brace and he had uh, crutches, but he know, but, you know, and he got God knows loaded up with how many drugs um, to make himself seem healthier. But I think that it was incredibly important for people like Bob Dole or people like Dan Inouye to show their disability. Because like, like one of the things I think about when I'm on the Capitol is I think, God, this place is really inaccessible. Um, I think about yes. all, the big, all the big doors or all the doors you have to push uh, to, to get through. Or I think about the places that are only accessible through stairs. And like even I was on the Hill yesterday. And I was thinking to myself, wow, you know, it's going to be, you know, I imagine for someone like Bob Dole who had like his, who couldn't use his right arm and a lot of mobility was, you know, compromised in his other, in his other arm. I think, man, he must have, he, he probably had a hell of a time getting around here. Uh, and even so it, it was incredibly important. But even then, I think it's important to remember, think about it this way. Bob Dole was injured in 1945. The ADA wasn't passed until 1990. So that's what a full 45 years after he was 
injured that it still took that long. And of course there were laws like the Rehabilitation Act and the, but that was, Rehabilitation Act was like what, 18 years to, uh, or, or like 28 years after World War II. Uh, the uh, Education for Handicapped Children Act was in 1975, so that was 30 years after. So it wasn't like it was a thing that happened overnight. Even still, with all these disabled veterans, it still took a hell of a long time. Yeah, and there's a cultural and a societal shift here, too, because like you were saying, the World War II generation drove a lot of this discussion. In the 70s, Congress was almost 75 percent veterans, and then that number dropped down to very, very few Nowadays, modern days, we're getting a new wave of veterans, and we have disabled veterans and other disabled people in Congress now. That seems to be upticking. Uh, Do you see that we, because you cover Congress, do you see that maybe we'll have another wave of uh, advocacy and legislation because we do have this new wave? We have some real high pro, uh, Senator Duckworth, uh, Congressman Mass, Congressman Baird. Uh, Congressman Crenshaw, even because he has the eye patch, because he's yeah. self-conscious about his glass eye. These people are very upfront in things. Do you see that this could be like the the Bob Dole era, where we can have maybe a new resurgence of recognition for these folks and what we should be doing for them? On top of that, you also have a lot of veterans who are willing to talk about their invisible disabilities. Yes, like, uh, Congressman Seth Moulton, who has talked very openly about PTSD. Uh, and I think it's important to include those invisible disabilities as well as the visible disabilities. Um, yes and no. I think that you're seeing a lot of them now. You're seeing, you're seeing a, a deluge of them because as the Iraq and Afghanistan wars are ending, you're seeing a lot of people say, hey, maybe you should run for Congress. And you see, But I, I think also the difference, and I write about this in my, my kind of long piece for the New Republic about it, is that it's kind of almost become a product of polarization uh, so the, the extent that you have uh, you have Dan Crenshaw attacking Tammy Duckworth, uh, I don't know from any of my experience if like there's like a disabled veterans club, like there was, uh, you know, you know, with NOA and Hart and like um, Dole or anything. I think partially it's just because the um, the caucuses are so siloed nowadays. And there's more of an incentive if you are a rising star to throw partisan invective uh, than there is to, you know, stand up for the other person. Because, like, what's interesting is that John Kerry, even it was different with with Vietnam veterans, John John McCain and John Kerry defended each other. And John McCain was disgusted when the, when Saxby Chambliss' campaign did the Max Cleland ad. Uh, because Max Cleland lost three of his limbs. Who just recently died, by the way, for folks who yeah, don't yeah, know. Max, he just died, yeah. Uh, and he was the, the, the victim of a disgusting smear campaign. Uh, so it was important to, uh, it, it was important then, but I don't think that there's that kind of comedy now. As as polarization has happened, as redistricting has happened, and as, as there's more of an incentive now, there's more of a reward for politicians to, lob bombs on the other side than there is to hey we have this shared experience let's focus on this and let's uh let, let, let's change this uh these uh these laws to, to 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 facilitate other people i think that there's a little too much of that uh there, there's there's it's become a product of partisan invective unfortunately you know, talking to Eric Garcia, the reason we're bringing this up is it's not just uh, disabled veterans in Congress or disabled members of Congress. According to the CDC, one in four Americans has some kind of a registered or recognized disability. Um, this is just something that's always been an issue, and it's always been an issue to try to get some uh, coverage and then policy to make uh, probable change for these folks. And when you have somebody like Bob Dole pass off the scene where they're not in front, it's like, okay, well, who's this next group going to be? And you're talking about the policy, the invective and the politics of it. Uh, Where is some policy common ground that you can see that maybe we can get? Because we don't have like a big ADA coming up anytime in the near future, I don't think. This is all smaller stuff, yeah? It's interesting. I think that what you're going to see on when it comes to disabilities, you're going to see more things on the state level. So, for example, one thing that there might actually be some consensus on is with uh, ending sub-minimum wage labor. So, for those who don't know... uh, it sounds just as bad as what it's, but what I'm describing. There's a section of the Fair Labor Standards Act that allows for uh, paying 
disabled people. It's the same clause that allows for tipped wages. It's the same, the same uh, that allows to pay disabled people below minimum wage. So one thing that you've actually seen is you've seen some Republicans pick it up. You saw Governor Greg Abbott in Texas, who is a disabled Republican, he uses a wheelchair, sign the legislation to, I think, if you do contracts with the Texas government, you can't pay disabled people submit below minimum wage. So that was a that was a, a big deal. And you know, I think that Governor Abbott deserves a lot of credit for that. You've seen someone like uh, you've seen people like Kathy as diverse as Kathy McMurse Rogers and Alexandria Ocasio Cortez come out in support of ending some minimum wage labor. Uh, Kathy McMurse Rogers was part of Republican leadership until a few years ago. She might become ways uh, energy and commerce chairwoman if Republicans, or I should say when they take back the house in 2022, <laughs> it's looking like a bloodbath. Um, but I think that what you're, but because in Congress, it seems like a minimum wage increase would be a sub minimum wage labor raise would be had to be tied to a minimum wage increase generally. I think it would be more likely to happen in on the state level. You're seeing similar movings in South Carolina, Kentucky. Um, you're seeing you're seeing it in a few other states that have just ended uh, sub minimum wage labor on the state level. So I think that's really where the change is going to happen. I think you're also going to see what's really going to what's interesting is you're going to see I think if. President Biden passes his Build Back Better agenda, which has $150 billion for home and community-based care, which allows for disabled people to receive uh, receive care in their homes instead of nursing homes or institutions. There are a lot of states with Republican governors, and Republicans tend to, tend to be pretty in favor of home and community-based services, at least in the past they were. It was actually started by, under the, during the Reagan administration. So it'd be interesting to see how Medicaid services in... Uh, Republican states, even though Republicans don't support it, when they get that money, how are they going to distribute that? How are they going to try to clear the wait list? How they're going to try to cl clear the queue? Because right now, the wait list is somewhere around 820,000 people. You have parents putting their kids on the wait list when wow. they're kids so that when they turn 18, they can get on it. So that, that'll be interesting to see. <laughs> yeah. We're talking to Eric Garcia on Hertel Radio. We're going to take a quick break and more with him. He's covering Bob Dole, the recent passing of him and talking disability rights. Uh, we'll be right back with him right after. To Eric Garcia on Hertel Radio, a congressional reporter for The Independent, covers all kinds of things going on in the halls of power, which are mourning one of the, um, whichever way you want to put it, certainly a titan of Congress and the Senate for many, many years. Bob Dole has passed away. Uh, you've wrote about this in detail. Uh, you have a piece at the New Republic out. Uh, talk about, because Bob Dole does have a bit of a complex history. He We have the famous moment in the 70s, the, the debate with Mondale, where Mondale calls mm. him a hatchet man, and he almost, he just smiles at him. He, he wore yeah. that proudly. Uh, but he was also instrumental on things like ADA, like other legislation. How did you go to parse out that kind of complicated history with somebody who very honorably served his country, obviously gave a lot to his country, both life-wise and physically, but also had some policy stuff that a lot of people found questionable? Yeah, I mean, I think that he was like a lot. Of, I mean, he was he taking into account he was from Kansas. So in Kansas has is just a solidly Republican state it has a Democratic governor now. But uh, that was just because Kobach was the nominee in 2018, uh, Chris Kobach. But it, it's interesting because he I think very much growing up in the Dust Bowl, even before he grew, even before he became uh, even before he served in World War II, being from being from Kansas during that time, you learn a lot about individualism and you learn a lot about, you know, you kind of had to tough it out. Uh, but at the same time, he's, you know, I didn't get to write this, but other people have written about this. He signed welfare checks for his family or, or, or he saw, you know, so he, he learned about, he learned, I forget, there was one former speechwriter of his that there was, a, there was a piece where he said like, he learned about collective responsibility without learning about collectivism. And he learned about community without, you know, obviously, this person to say that he learned about community without learning communism. So I think that he learned that. So he he was a Republican through and through, and he was a, he was a Republican until the day he died. And he was a, he was what I think many people would call in the business world a company man. Uh, and I I, I I I think that's why you know he was before he was ever you know a nominee he was RNC chairman he was a congressman he was a, he was a senator. 
He was, uh, he was Gerald Ford's running mate because people didn't feel that Nelson Rockefeller was conservative enough. And then he ran for president three times, once against, you know, George Bush and Ronald Reagan, again against George Bush, and then again in 96 when he was the nominee. And I think that, so there was that, he was the company man, but I think also when he came to Congress, and because he knew people who were disabled like him, he met people who were Democrats, he met people like uh I think that what I learned was that he was a conservative, no doubt, and he thought about how government could be used to, con to achieve conservative ends. And he very much saw the Voting Rights Act, the Civil Rights Act, and the Rehabilitation Act, and later on the ADA as a continuation of that, while not giving up what he saw as conservative values. I think the difference was, and I think that that also goes to why he actually did unlike a lot of people who talk about themselves being fiscal conservatives, he actually did care about fiscal conservatism. That's why when he was, uh, when he was, I believe, Ways and Means or Appropriations Committee Chairman, or Finance, Finance Committee Chairman, he raised taxes. You know, uh, he did the largest peacetime tax increase during the 1980s. Um, and it was because he cared about balanced budgets. Uh, and that and he was right. He, he was he was smart to do that. But there was a lot of invective and pushback because the right wing in America was starting to radicalize. And Newt Gingrich actually called him the tax collector for the welfare state. And what's interesting is that that kind of took Dole by surprise because usually he was used to throwing those kind of uh, verbal lobs at, uh, at at people. And he was just like, wait, what the hell? Um, but but I think that what happened is that like, he still believed in government and he still believed that government had responsibilities, even if it couldn't fix everybody's problems. And what happened is in the 19, late 1980s to the early 1990s, the GOP started to move toward a more, I guess what, what I call it in the, in, in the piece for the New Republic, I say the GOP became more strictly anti-government rather than using government to achieve conservative ends. And that is really, I think that he never real. I think he tried to strike that balance, but he was not always uh, successful. It seems to me reading your pieces that you've been writing about him and just reviewing Bob Dole's life overall, um, it, both his life and the discussion we've been having since his death on things like social media and commentary, this seems to be a pretty good little microcosm of kind of the, the difficulties when talking about things like disabled persons, because there's always that conflict of, you want to help somebody, you want to get them help, but you also want to let them have their identity and have their as much freedom as they can possibly have. This seems like this is all kind of fell under that in a lot of ways of like, okay, what's the role of government? What's the role of an individual to take care of themselves? Where's the line of people stepping in and helping them? These are all really complex issues that is always going to be at the heart of these disability issues, isn't it? Uh, yeah. So, I mean, I, I think, you know, it's interesting because his, I, I go back to his maiden speech a lot because I think that was kind of his lodestar for a lot of ways. Um, in his maiden speech, he talked about exclusion. He talked about the exclusion that disabled people would say. He says, maybe not exclusion from the front of the bus, but perhaps from even climbing aboard it. Maybe not exclusion from pursuing advanced education, but perhaps from experiencing any formal education. Maybe not exclusion from day-to-day -day life itself, but perhaps from an adequate opportunity to develop and contribute to his or her fullest capacity. And I think that in and of itself was a, uh, was, 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 a was a big part of who he, who he was. But then he also opened with, uh, he opened that speech or, or he was, or he taught, or he also included in that speech talking about vocational rehabilitation. And he talked about, he told this really important story about a pair of a man who was a player paraplegic and was referred to a state federal vocational rehabilitation office. And that allowed him to get an insurance, get a job as an insurance agent, have a home, adopt a child. And he says, it takes place now because the Congress and the federal government initiated and guided a vital and, guild, and guild, guided a vital rigorous program of vocational rehabilitation. And I think that is what he saw is that he didn't want people to look up, look with him upon pity, look upon him with pity. And I think, I don't think any disabled person wants people to look upon them with pity. There's a whole book by Joe Shapiro that I have right here. It's called No Pity about the history of the disability rights movement. Um, uh, and it was very much, we don't want you to have pity on us. We want you to be, to treat us as equals. And I think that for, I think a lot of liberals like that because liberals believe in the idea of civil rights for everyone. 
and I think a lot of conservatives could find things that they liked about what Bob Dole said, because it's not the government giving them a handout. And one thing I, I it's funny, I, was, I spent so much time in the New Republic writing about the bipartisan consensus on disability that I didn't stop to think, what actually was the bipartisan consensus on disability? So I'm going to say it right here, right now, what I think it is. The bipartisan consensus on disability was that if that conservatives said, okay, we are going to promote disability rights because then that way that allows disabled people to determine their own destiny. It gets them out of government run state hospitals, state institutions, and allows them to determine their own destiny by finding work, getting off government benefits and, you know, empowering themselves themselves. Liberals said, okay, we are going to give, so that was the concession liberals gave to, give to conservatives. And in exchange, conservatives gave to liberals, we will give a group of people who have been historically marginalized special rights, and or not special, I don't want to say, but encoded rights and protections so that they are not treated specially. That's why I took walk back on special, but we'll give them these rights and protections to ensure that they are, that they have the equal opportunity in the eyes of the law and they have certain legal protections that ensure that their rights aren't violated. And that seemed to be the compromise that lasted, I would say from like the 1950s to the 1990s. Yeah, Eric Garcia, appreciate you so much. He reports for The Independent. He's doing all kinds of uh, the Lord's work on all this complicated congressional stuff that's going on, so make sure you follow him. He's got a great book out, uh, We're Not Broken. Uh, he did a nice long podcast with me. You wanna go check that out, but. Let folks know about the book and where they can follow you and all your uh, machinations in the political realm, my friend. Yeah, okay. So I'm going to, so, so I, I actually, Andrew, you saw what I tweeted last night. So I'm going to just say it. Yeah, uh, please. We're not, broken, we're, we're not broken, changing the autism conversation. So what, what happened is I was looking at the NYT bestseller list last night and I saw that Robert F. Kennedy, that jackass uh, <laughs> who's been promoting anti vaccine nonsense, is on the New York Times bestseller list. So I'm doing a challenge right now that it, this week I'm turning 31. If it winds up the New York Times bestseller list this week, I'm going to get two tattoos. So, and it knocks out Robert F. Kennedy. I'll get two tattoos. So that's the plan. But otherwise than that, Andrew, it's always great being on the show. Yeah, we'll go do ink together because I'm overdue, even though you're 10 years younger than me and I refuse to believe that. But you do great work, sir. And I greatly appreciate you. I look forward to talking to you again, my friend. Look forward to talking to you again. Thanks. Thanks.